Welcome to Price Class number 116, and today we're talking about the effects of surface roughness on shockwave boundary layer interactions at Mach 4 flows over a cylinder. And in the last few podcasts, or maybe the last dozen or so, a few times we've looked at the effects of the surface roughness on the boundary layer and flow in general over low speed, so subsonic flows over, for example, airfoils. So I thought it'd be interesting to look at the supersonic component of it. So do, does the surface roughness affect the shockwave boundary layer interactions, where the boundary layer occurs, where the shockwaves occur, et cetera? So that's what we're here to find out. So the paper we're looking at is called Effects of Surface Roughness on Shockwave slash Turbulent Boundary Layer Interaction at Mach 4 over a Hollow Cylinder Flare Model. And this is open access, so you can find it in the link in the description. So let's get on with it. So in the introduction, they say hypersonic flows can generate high enthalpy conditions along the surface of a vehicle, necessitating the use of novel high temperature materials with surface architectures that may exhibit roughness. Some high speed systems also require ablative materials, and that ablation process is known to produce non-uniform surface roughness, striations, and cross hatching. So what is ablation? So ablation is a very common technique for controlling the temperature of a surface. For example, when you have the space shuttle coming in, or when it used to be flying, <laughs> when you had the space shuttle coming in, it would get very hot. And no matter what you do, it's going to get hot. It, it's traveling at like, uh, to begin with, it's like Mach 30 and it slows down to obviously zero when it lands, but it's in a hypersonic condition for much of its flight. So what that means is the temperatures are very hot. They can be three, four, five thousand 5,000 degrees Kelvin. So you have the option of either burning your actual spacecraft or putting something on the outside that will burn off instead. And this is called the ablation. So you have this material on the outside where all this heat comes in and then the material itself will then just start to burn off. And that burning process uses up all or most of the temperature, most of that energy, that kinetic energy. And the rest of the actual aircraft that you care about is left relatively unaffected. So this ablation process can then, it obviously occurs fairly unevenly because um, first of all, you have different heating um, concentration parts, but also just the material itself will start to break off fairly randomly, which then results in having a fairly rough surface. So this roughness is actually a real life phenomenon and whether this roughness affects the boundary or not is to be determined. So they say ablation is a process involving coupled heat and mass transfer that is characterized by the, by the removal of material from a surface by aerodynamic heating. Ablative heat shields have been used to cool and protect space capsules during the atmospheric reentry since the early days of crewed spaceflight. So that's true. For example, if you go to the, um, the space center in Washington, D.C., I think that's called the Kennedy Space Center there. And I think even the Johnson one in uh, Texas, both of them have, at the very least, some of the Apollo mission capsules and or the Mercury and Gemini uh, capsule missions. And these capsules on the bottom, they you can actually look at these real life capsules and they are rough. And this is because this ablation material, as it was coming through the atmosphere, was burning and it left a lot of like these tiny little divots in there from just random heating and burning off. And we still use this cup top technology today. So ablation is even more likely to introduce disturbed roughnesses on surface, on, on a surface when employed, when employing state-of-the-art complex three-dimensional woven composite materials. These materials, such as woven carbon carbon and woven carbon silicon carbide, present the issue that different components of the arc of the composite often ablate at different rates. These surfaces, these surface features can then interact with the boundary layer and may lead to the generation of acoustic disturbances, premature turbulent transition, and even elevated heat transfer to the vehicle infrastructure. Although the effects of the roughness and undulating surface topology have been well documented for low-speed flows, and discrete roughness elements and boundary layer trips in high-speed flows have been investigated, there are very few efforts where dis distributed roughnesses have been studied in supersonic and hypersonic flows. So I should probably mention here the difference between hypersonic and supersonic flows. There are a couple of different ways of defining it. One way that is often just done as a rule of thumb is when the flow is above Mach 5, then we pretty much say, okay, it's hypersonic. And between three Mach 3 and Mach 5, we say it's kind of like supersonic hypersonic. But in reality, the real definition is like the theoretical definition is when the atoms that you have, all the molecules of air, when they start to dissociate, so they become ions, that is when you start to have hypersonic flow. 
So what happens is the electrons on the outside start to rip off and then you get plasma. And that is hypersonic flow now. And you're flying through plasma and plasma is the most abundant um, material, like the most abundant state in the, in the universe. It makes up like 98% of the entire universe. The sun is completely plasma pretty much. So Mach 4 is kind of in that range where it's supersonic slash hypersonic, depending on um, the air and what it's doing. But some of the um, elements in the air are definitely going to be ionized. So to further complicate system design, supersonic systems will inevitably experience shockwave boundary interactions. And that can be generated by fins, control surfaces, and control jets. Surface uh, shockwave and boundary interactions can lead to adverse pressure gradients that are strong enough to produce flow separation while inducing unsteady behavior within the interaction region. Given the highly unsteady nature of shockwave boundary, boundary layer interactions, the resulting elevated heat and pressure loads can put considerable stress on a vehicle design and in some instances lead to catastrophic failure. Shockwave boundary layer interactions have been in analyzed with a variety of canonical geometries, including hinging shocks, cylinders, and compression ramp shock generators. So we want to better understand and classify these shock structures across a range of Mach and Reynolds numbers. Considerable effort has been made to characterize the impact of incoming boundary layer states on the shockwave boundary layer interactions, as well as from laminar to transition to turbulent incoming boundary layers. Key flow features within shockwave boundary layer interactions have been studied through the analysis of surface pressure measurements, shock foot locations, and high-speed Schlieren images while using descriptive statistics among the structures developed within the interaction. Structures uh, such as separated shocks can also be visualized and easily identified with Schlieren imaging. The largest body, we'll cover actually what Schlieren imaging is in a minute, but let's just continue here. This large body of work has demonstrated that shockwave boundary interactions exhibit a characteristic low frequency unsteadiness that typically resides with a true number of 0.01 to 0.1 with relatively high energy broadband unsteadiness for turbulent shockwave boundary interactions. And the potential for sharp spectral peaks in the unsteadiness of the transition on the traditional shockwave boundary interactions. Even though shockwave boundary interactions have been studied in detail with a wide body of previous research, there are no known peer review open access publications that have attempted to characterize the impact of the surface roughness on this. So that's what this present work is to, looking at. And to do so, they're going to be looking at a cylinder flare model with a Mach number of four, the, the free stream velocity. Commercially available carbon fiber was selected as a canonical distributed roughness texture to provide a comparison between a smooth and rough surface. Here, an analysis of high-speed Schlieren imaging is provided using a custom shock tracking algorithm. A variety of statistical data on the unsteady shock motion were produced. So let's talk about the experimental facility. The MAC, the wind tunnel facility, the MAC for low enthalpy lug width, <coughs> sorry, let me say that again. The MAC for low enthalpy lug, Ludwig tube facility at the University of Tennessee was used to acquire Schlieren images for this experiment. So what is a Ludwig tunnel? So a Ludwig tunnel is very simple. It's um, a very easy way of producing a supersonic flow. And all it is is a wind tunnel and then upstream you have this tank and you pressurize this tank to really high pressures. And then this tank has a opening obviously where it connects to the rest of the tunnel and it has this membrane. Then you pierce the membrane once you get to a certain pressure. Often this is done automatically. Like once it hits a certain pressure, it will do it automatically. Other times you can do it to yourself. It just depends. Either way, you pierce this membrane. Then because the pressure inside the tank is so high, the air then just runs out and you can use any other fluid really, but it's usually air and it has to be compressible, I guess. And it just flows out and creates a sonic flow and supersonic flow. And usually you can get up to like Mach 3, Mach 4 quite easily. They're using Mach 4 here. So that's how that works. So they say, given the nature of the Ludwig tunnel on using mylar diaphragms, which is what they're using for this um, little part that segregates the tube from the rest of the tunnel, which they pierce, there is a roughly a 15% uncertainty in target burst pressure prior to each test. For this reason, the burst pressures were slightly different between the smooth and rough uh, surface tests, leading to Reynolds numbers that differ by 12%. However, it is assumed that in the present study, this change in Reynolds number has a significantly smaller impact on the interaction when compared to the change in te uh, surface texture. So let's talk about the test geometries. So the steel body of the uh, hollow cone, so this... Um, sorry, hollow cylinder flare, which is, if you're 
uh, what, listening to this, you can see this video on YouTube or you can see it on uh, Spotify, but it's effectively a one tube at the start. Then imagine another tube behind it. And then there's just this ramp between the two connecting the two. So that's the hollow cone flare. Oh, sorry, the hollow, hollow cylinder flare. The steel body of the hollow cylinder flare was cleaned thoroughly to remove adhesives from previous testing and maintain a polished surface from the smooth surface test. While a 3K woven carbon fiber was applied to the steel of the hollow cylinder flare with a spray on adhesive for a rough surface test. The average surface roughness was obtained by using a profilometer after preparing both surfaces. Measurements of surface roughnesses indicate that the average roughness was 0.85 micrometers for the smooth um, hollow cylinder flare and 9.22 micrometers for the one with the carbon fiber sleeve on it. So in other words, the rough surface was more than 10 times rougher than the uh, smooth surface. And they're going to be the two different objects used here. They say that the hollow cylinder flare was used uh, here because it is axisymmetric, so it gives a quasi two-dimensional interaction and thus simplifies the uh, analysis of their study. And in figure two, they have close-ups of the smooth and rough hollow cylinder flares. And the rough one is fairly rough. Like if you've been in racing, for example, if you look at the um, tailpipes of homemade uh, <laughs> like uh, exhaust systems for like go-karts and that, often that kind of texture on the outside, which is usually carbon fiber, is the same as what you see here, if you've seen that before. So let's talk about the experimental uh, setup. The Schlieren imaging, was employed to obtain high-speed shock footage, shock foot location data. Over 70 milliseconds, oh, sorry, over the 70 millisecond steady state test period for each case, the high-speed Schlieren system captured up to 14,000 images, which is amazing. So let's talk about what Schlieren is before we go any further. We've got some results here, but Schlieren imaging, it's a little bit hard to draw um, yeah, on this at least, but I'll do my best. So. Let's say you have um, an object or whatever in, in the flow, let's say a cylinder and you have flow going over it, blah, blah, blah. Let's look at it from the side on. So let's say you have the cylinder and the flow is going into the page. Now what you do is on one side, you have a point light source. And this is very important because you want to just come from one point. And on the other side, you have um, a mirror and it's concave. So it then focuses all the rays coming from this one light source. It hits them and then it focuses it back at a certain point. And typically it will be pretty close to where the light source is again. That's how you would uh, position it. Now you have a camera behind, but instead of the entire light hitting the aperture, you actually have a knife edge right in front of this point where it converges. And the reason why you have this is because the knife edge is very sharp, which means that it cuts off all this light or at least most of it. And the reason why this is important is because by using the different densities of the air that we are seeing, we will then be able to see the image and how does this work. So with the flow going over the object, if we are at high speeds, for example, at supersonic flows, we then start to get shocks forming. And shocks result in differences in density upstream compared to downstream. And it's not only shocks that do this, but shocks do it very nicely. So this system is set up very well for high speed flows, for supersonic flows. But even if you just have a regular wake, you will get di different densities in the wake, but they're very small. So they can be very difficult to see with this uh, technique. But let's stick to shocks first. So across this shock band, we have different densities of air. So what happens is the light will diffract or we will change angle uh, across this shock wave. So that means instead of the light coming back and hitting the knife edge, some of it will actually skip over the top and go into our camera now. So depending on where the shocks are, we will see some light. And depending on where the other shocks are, some of that light we blocked out. That will create an image like we see here, where we have some light lines, some dark lines. The dark lines are where there is no light coming in because the light that was refracted from different densities uh, didn't go into the camera, whereas the other light parts that were refracted did go into the, the camera. So that allows us to see these shocks here. So as I mentioned, that it's not just for shockwaves that this can work for. It can work for um, different for wakes because there are different densities of air in a wake. It's, it's just that the density changes are so small that the changes in this um, focal point are 
very small as well, which makes it difficult to pick up. But you can use this also in thermal situations. So for example, if you have um, a plume, like a, a flame, above the flame, you have different temperatures, which means you have different densities of the gas mixture or the, the burnt gas mixture. And that is going to diffract the light differently. And that's going to result in a slurring imaging um, situation and it will work very nicely. So that's what slurring imaging is. It's very easy, um, theoretically, I guess, <laughs> but um, to, to tweak it to get it right is somewhat challenging. So let's move on to the results and discussion of how the surface roughness affects the boundary layer um, and shockwave interactions. So figure four shows instantaneous and mean images of the two test conditions that, that were obtained from the steady state portions of the individual wind tunnels as seen here. Now from these images, they say the boundary layer heights were estimated at 2.6 millimeters and 11.4 millimeters for the smooth and rough surfaces respectively. Now I'm not really sure how they are able to find this because I can't really tell from these images. Perhaps they have another method or something that um, I'm not too aware of. What I can see from, see from these images is that there's a very slightly thicker black line on the bottom and then it goes into this triangle. That's the um, hollow cylindrical uh, cylinder flare here where you have the smooth portion then you have that um, chamfer bit here going into the, the last bit of the cylinder. I also see these nice straight lines that indicate the shock. As for the boundary layer thickness, I can't really see how, how you can tell where that is. Perhaps where this lighter line starts is the end of the boundary layer. I'm not really sure. But they're saying that they estimated it to be 2.6 millimeters and 9.4 millimeters for the smooth and rough surfaces, respectively. Also to note is that on the top, we have the transient results. So this is just a, a, like a split image of the um, flow at one point in time. Then the bottom images are um, averages. So they're steady state effectively. And that indicates that the shocks and the flow physics are fairly unsteady because they don't line up exactly. There is quite a lot of blurring. And we'll get into that in a little bit. So in figure five, it shows annotated instantaneous Schlieren images for both surfaces. So they say here, the separated shock, as we mentioned earlier, and then the shear layer and recirculation zones can be seen here as well. Again, they are fairly difficult to see, but um, if you look closer, I guess they're there. They say the separation shock is clearly visible for each case upstream of the flare. The area underneath the shock can uh, has been established in the shockwave boundary layer interaction literature based uh, to contain a separated flow region, a recirculation flow region, and a corresponding shear layer. Although not apparent in the still instantaneous images, these structures can be observed when watching high-speed Schlieren animations. The shocks are clearly at different angles, even when considering the scales of the interactions are vastly different. Animations of the Schlieren imaging also make it clear that the shock structure is highly unsteady. This low-frequency shock unsteadiness was the focus of the analysis presented here. So what they're saying is, among other things, you can see that the shock angle of the rough surface is significantly different to the, the smooth surface. So already we can see that the roughness makes this um, shock angle more oblique and that potentially will reduce um, the strength of it based if you have other objects downstream hitting it potentially. Um, they also say that the shocks were unsteady so they were moving around a little bit which is what we'll look at in a little bit here. So let's move on to figure seven. Figure seven A shows the tracked shock foot location at a function as a function of time, sorry. The rough surface time series demonstrates that the shock foot location is further away from the origin when compared to the smooth surface as observed in the Schlieren images. The histogram normalized as a prob probability foot, uh, density function provided in 7b confirms the mean shock foot location, LS, is found to be five and 10 times the uh, boundary thickness for the smooth and rough surfaces respectively. So in other words, the shock wave is occurring further upstream for the rougher surface compared to the smooth surface. That's what they, that's all this is saying here. Additionally, both data sets possess a slightly high, slightly right-handed skewness. This is seen noticeably within the rough shock foot position data as the surface exhibited a longer tail in the downstream uh, direction. The shock angles were found to be 20 and 29 degrees for the rough and smooth surfaces respectively. So again, the rough uh, surface resulted in a much more oblique shock wave, which is can be very beneficial. So let's look at figure eight, which is pretty sweet. I haven't seen this too often, and it's nicer than this here. Figure eight 
shows the shock intermittency. So what is the shock intermittency? So as I mentioned, the shock um, point at which the shock occurs changes slightly. So if you go to, um, let's say, like five millimeters downstream, you might get the shock there a little bit of the time. Then you go six millimeters downstream, might be there a little bit more of the time, but not always. And then you go down 10 millimeters and it's there like 90% of the time. And then you go down 12 millimeters and it's there all the time, 100% at the very least. Uh, so that gives you a general range of when the shock will be occurring. That's what intermittency is. It tells you how how likely the likely the, the um, chance is that the shock will be at this point. So for the smooth and rough surfaces, they have them plotted in the left-hand figure. And they say that the intermittency of the rough surface is shown to be within minus six to minus 12, um, like banjo, I think this is upstream of the, like, the um, point at which the flare flares up. Whereas the smooth surface lies between minus two and minus seven from this point. So in other words, the shock starts much further upstream for the rough surface. And by the time we even get to the point where the shock will start to be seen at the smooth surface, the rough surface, there's definitely going to be a shock there. So the intermittency range is much greater, but it's also much further upstream than the smooth surface. What this means is that the rough surface pretty much accelerates the formation of the shock. So it's kind of like reduces the critical Mach number, I guess you could say. Maybe, maybe that's not a great way of putting it, but I'm guessing that that relation would occur um, based on this as well. So figure nine shows the one side of spe auto spectral density functions it were calculated for both shock foot locations. The spectral signature of the shock motion is shown in figure 9a. Upon inspection, the spectral energy of the signals is noticeably different, and the coherence in figure 9b confirms that the signals do not possess similar spectral signatures. So there's a very low coherence here between the two different signals. And you can see this also just from the 9a anyway, that they drop off differently, so the coherence is going to be quite different at high um, frequencies anyway. So the rough sh shock foot data possesses a peak spectral energy between 6 and 10 kilohertz with a steadily decreasing energy signature for high frequencies. The smooth shock foot data exhibits a power spectral density signature that gradually increases with increasing frequency and no apparent peaks. It is possible that oscillations for the smooth case are centered at lower frequencies that are difficult to measure in impulse wind tunnel facility owing to the relatively short test times. So what they're saying here is that the smooth shock wave had very um, high, a lot of energy at high frequencies, but at low frequencies, it didn't have as much. And this may be due to the test um, facility that they have, which is the Ludwig tube. That can only really sustain a flow for very short periods of time, which means that trying to measure low frequencies is a challenge because just <laughs> you don't have the time to do it. Um, but high frequencies are fine. On the other hand, the rough um, boundary layer, sorry, the rough... Um, uh, surface, the shock coming off that had a lot more energy at these low frequencies than high frequencies. So that at the very least shows that the shocks are different in terms of the energy spectrum at high frequencies. <clears throat> so the nevertheless, the analysis demonstrated that the shock wave boundary interaction dynamics for the two cases are considerably different. Figures 9C and D present these results in terms of the stool number using two different uh, length scales, the intermittent region length and the incoming boundary layer height length with two different length scales here. Whereas much of the previous literature for the compression ramp interactions employed a true number based on the intermittent length of the shock interaction, this scaling produces surprisingly high peak true numbers of one for the rough surface at least. This may indicate that the intermittent length is not the appropriate scaling factor for this uh, hollow cylinder uh, flare. So for comparison, the, inter the incoming boundary layer thickness was used, which gave a peak intensity of a true number of 0 0.1 for the rough surface um, shock wave boundary layer interaction, which is more in line with the low frequency unsteadiness observed in previous work. So figure 10 shows instabilities within the Schlieren imaging, and they're, showing, they're characterized by the true number. So they've looked at the Schlieren imaging, what the um, changes in these different properties are, in the, like every pixel, and then they've normalized that to the true number effectively. As done by Coombs and others, so other researchers, a representative true number was calculated for each pixel by identifying the peak frequency at each individual location based on the instantaneous fluctuation of the Schlieren image intensity. 
The results were plotted on a color map with a range from zero to unity on a log scale. Both surfaces show a true number approaching unity in the free stream region, as would be expected. In general, lower true number values are seen in the vicinity of the shock structure and in the separated flow region. These values correspond to the relatively low frequency shock unsteadiness and that has been observed to occur at near true numbers of 0.01 to 0.1. It is interesting to observe that although a low frequency peak was not observed in the power spectral density of the smooth surface shock, the low frequency unsteadiness is evident in figure 10. So what they're saying here is the images are showing that there is data that they're not picking up in other um, ways, namely that there is high frequency, uh, like high energy at low frequencies in a smooth shock, uh, the smooth um, <laughs> surface shock, but they didn't see that in the other data. So it may be there, maybe not. Meanwhile, for the rough surface um, sur shock uh, wave pendulum interaction case, the low frequency unsteadiness is more confined to the shock structure. There appears to be some higher frequency unsteadiness inside the shock structure and the, and the shear layer or separated flow region for the rough surface case. So in other words, there is higher frequency, high energy at higher frequencies for the turbulent band, the, um, the um, rough surface one, but for the smooth surface one, there seems to be more energy at lower frequencies, which they didn't pick up from their other measurements. So that could just be a limitation of their experimental uh, apparatus. So in conclusion, we looked at what the effects of the surface roughness were, was on the um, shock waves that are forming. And they found that the rough surface produces a peak in spectral energy between six and 10 kilohertz, whereas an energy peak was not observed for the smooth surface case. So this is due to the fluctuation of the boundary layer where it's occurring, where it's not occurring. As I mentioned, the boundary layer does not always occur, sorry, the shock does not always occur at one point. It does move around a little bit and that's when intermittency occurs. What they also found was that the surface roughness does change where this boundary layer does occur. So if you increase the roughness, it will move upstream and it will also occur over a longer period, so over a longer distance, sorry. So it will move upstream and by the time you get to the smooth, um, the point where the smooth um, surface will trigger a shock wave, the um, rough surface has already definitely triggered a shock, shock wave. So they say when analyzing images on a per pixel basis, it was evident that low frequency unsteadiness dominated the shock motion and separated flow region dynamics. Computers' true numbers uh, for shock motion fell within 0.1 to 1, which are consistent with the archival literature. However, the power spectral density profiles of the rough versus smooth interaction cases were considerably different and the rough wall was exhibited, sorry, exhibited an attenu attenuated energy signature when compared to the smooth wall case. So, that's the end of this podcast. I hope you liked it. I thought it was a good addition to our low speed um, surface roughness uh, things that we're looking at. And this was very high speed. This is Mac 4. So it's getting into like almost hypersonic. And make sure to like it and give this a, a subscribe and thumbs up. And if you want to get better at CFD and or theory yourself, for example, we're looking at theory here, uh, check out our courses in the link description. And if you want to make your experiments two to four percent more accurate, check out Amasu Hawk. I guess it rid of the density error for you, which the density of air changes every day and between hours, and that can really screw up your experimental results. Um, you often won't even, even know it. You'll just get <laughs> data that doesn't match, and you, you're just like, what does this mean? I don't understand. It's probably due to the density of air changing, and you haven't accounted for that. So the atmosphere hall gets rid of that error for you. Thank you for that, and I'll see you next podcast. Peace out, amigos. 